Okay, turn your Bibles this morning. I got a lot of scriptures, so I'm just going to uh, give them real quick. You have my notes. You can turn them on yourself. If you don't have my notes, turn to John 15, put a bookmark. Galatians 4, put a bookmark. We're going to start with Matthew chapter 16, second verse. We're going to start with Psalms 127. We'll start there and read Matthew, almost back-to-back type thing, but I want to continue a series called Fine-Tuning Your Life. This is part three. This is the first in A, B, C, D, E session of uh, um, subtitle is Making Your Church a Better Place to Go. Um, Before I pray over this, I just want to get into my introduction, and then we'll pray for each other. So in this series, my pastor heart, what I am hoping to influence us as a church is making my home a better place to live, my home a better place to be, my church a better place to go, and making my community a better place to live. And so we have already gone through making your home a better place to be. And one of the emphasis that I I have tried to uh, emphasize is that um, Christianity has to start at home. It's more important for Christ to be the center of my home than it is the center of my church. If it's the center of my church, it's going to influence your home to be the center of Christ. But Christianity has to start at home. It has to be the place where the altar is. Christ has to be in the center of your living room to where the presence and the atmosphere of, of God's presence sets the tone for why you live. And so we spent how to make my home a better place to be. Well, we're going to be sp- spending more sessions on this one, how to make my church a better place to go. And um, we have uh, recently uh, gave to you uh, um, a survey. There were three people that responded to it. I understand four. I didn't get the fourth one until. But uh, um, this message this morning, I'm not going to incorporate your uh, responses, but I still want to give before you, we'll probably re-put that out for you to go online and take the survey and answer the question, if I wanted my church to be a better place to go, I would. And then I am really interested in your comments. I am am hoping to um, interlace that into the coming messages. But this morning, I want to do kind of a foundational part. And even before we read, let's kick this, uh, 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 this question around the room for a moment. Who is it that invented church? Jesus did. Not clergy. Not denomination. Our church is a part of the Pentecostal Church of God as a denomination. I've met a lot of people that when you talk about denominations, it leaves an ugly taste in their mouth and they'd rather not. And so I've heard a lot of people, I'm I'm kind of against organizations. I'm going, well, then you're against what God's government is because God is very organized and he is organized in a way to be more effective. That's what I believe the Pentecostal Church of God is an organization to be better at doing what we're called to do. Now, I think it's the best organization out there. I really do. I wrestled with this over 30 years ago, and I was, I was, a, I was a, at Assembly of God College, and I was studying about then, and, and you know, I, I saw so many. I was going to the Pentecostal Church of God's um, yearly conventions and board meetings and things like that, and I just got like, it's just nauseous to see the political area and I just gone God should I go to assembly of God should I become a licensed assembly of God pastor instead of a a Pentecostal church of God pastor because our doctrine is basically the same it's the structure of the organization and God spoke to me very clearly and this is also why I am still a pastor in Sealy Lake over 34 35 years ago he said I had you born and raised in Pentecost Church of God for a reason. When I want you to move, I'll let you know. 
So I said, okay. If you see something wrong with your organization, pray for it, try and change it, but don't bail ship. And so as a pastor, I've also taken that personally for me, there's multiple times on a Monday that I wanted to resign because I got all whiny and God, if you, if you, if you really love me, you, you is whatever, you, you know the, the etc. And God just has really spoken clear to me that um, if I want to make my church a better place to, to go, I've got to do something about my part in it, Right? And so that, uh, um, uh, um, who invented church? God did, not clergy, not organizations. Next question, who is church for? Us, yeah? Someone else, who's church for? Huh? We are the church. We are the, church. the body, believers in Christ Jesus. Someone else? It's for everyone, not just Christians. Church is for the pre-saved as well. Don't you like that word instead of the sinners lost? The church is for the pre-saved. They don't know they're saved yet. They'll, they'll get on board as we keep interceding for them. But uh, at, a, at a foundation this morning, I'm going to spend the majority of my time on the major foundation of this question. But if I wanted to make my church a better place to go, here's what I would do. And that's what I want to uh, um, challenge you. And, and this question um, is to kind of stimulate your, your thinking on a personal level, on a private basis. What, do you, what you do with that question is kind of up to you, whether you answer the survey or not. I'm not, you can put your name or you don't have to put your name, but it's basically to, uh, um, to get you involved in thinking about coming together and the purpose of church and why we're in Sealy Lake. And this is not to evaluate the problems that you know exist or to evaluate some, what someone else should be doing. This is for you. And I say this a lot because it's really important. For, draw a circle on the floor. The question's for me. What can I do? What should Gary do to make church a better place to go. And so this message has more to do with revelation than it does imparting of knowledge. I want to say that again, and then we're going to pray for each other. This message is more about God giving us revelation to his purpose for church than me giving you new information that you don't have. Most of you could preach this message way better than I can. And so what we want to do this morning, we're going to pray for in just a moment, is that the Spirit of God give us revelation as we read the Scripture, as we look about the topic, God, what do you want to do in Sealy Lake? What do you want to do in Faith Chapel? And so this morning, because it's about revelation, what I'd like to do, if you're sitting next to someone, and if it's okay, you don't mind, could you just lay your hand on their shoulder? And I want you, as I pray, to pray for revelation from God's heart to you. Yes, you need to know what you already know. But what we need from God today is not Gary Wayne. We don't need just the foundation of the truth I've lived with today, in this day, 2024, in Sealy Lake, this season, this time, what we need is revelation from God's heart to your heart. So if you're close enough to pray with someone, would you do that? I don't know what, I don't care what it looks like, but Father, right now, as we're in your presence, God, we sensed all the way through our singing time, your presence is here. And God, this morning, as we worship you, even now in the preaching time of this service, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would bring revelation from your heart. Oh God, I'm asking that you would guard us from Gary Wayne's prejudices. 
guard us from my, uh, the, the places that I don't have it accurate. And God, I pray that you would cause our ears to come alive to the voice of your spirit saying, this is what you need to do to change why I've called you, why I have appointed you to the kingdom for such a day as this. And so God, right now across this room, I pray for every heart to be open to the revelation of your Holy Spirit. God, we need that today. We're desperate for revelation, not just religious jargon. God, break through the enemy's strongholds that he would put within us that tends to make it religious, tends to become judgmental, tends to be, oh God, help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want to start as we look at our scriptures with this major foundation for this question. Here's a major foundation, and we need desperately, I speak in, in singular person, however the, the, the wording is, we, Gary Wayne needs this to change in my thinking because we have been so programmed by our American thinking that we screw this up on a regular basis. I've studied this, but on a regular basis, we need to understand the major foundation of what is church. Because when I talk about the question, when you receive the question, your knee-jerk reaction to that question has to do with what takes place on a Sunday morning. And church is greater than that, right? Church is not what takes place here on a Sunday morning. That's a part of it. But church is greater than that. Who invented church? Jesus did. God did. Who is it for? Us. So let's look at the major foundation of this whole question. If I wanted my church to be a better place to go, here's what I would do. But let's start with what's church. So in Psalms 127, verse 1, famous scripture, easy to under, uh, uh, memorize, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. Who build it? Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And so when it comes talking about church, unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. I've tried to do church building for 40, 50 years. At least 40. I started, though, in my teens. I'm 64 next month. So I've been at this, and my goal is to build a better church. But am I thinking Sunday morning gathering? Or do I have an accurate view of what church is? I want to wake you up just a little bit, kick this around the room. What comes to your mind when you hear that phrase, unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain? Talk to me. Unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain. Cults? What? Strong foundation. False prophets? Yes. Yes. A cathedral, front room. The Lord has to be the center, the focus of what you're doing, whether you're in a tent or a building or. Someone else? Yes. A spiritual house. Okay? Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. What does that mean? What comes to your mind? You have to be willing to take the Lord's input and use it to help build the house. You have to be willing to take the Lord's input to build the house. Yeah. Unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain. What has that to do with the question? Huh? God is the sender. Barbara? Channel, I see your wheels turning. Church is not a country club. Church is not a place where you come and sit down and sing. Good. Church is not a country club for Christians. It's a hospital for sinners. Yes. 
And what do we do? Yeah, yeah, good. What do we do at a hospital? We take care of people. Yes, yes, Lydia? For me, it's coming to worship, to be full. Coming to worship, to be full. Yes. Good. Good. To embrace him, to be filled by, take that with and affect where I'm going. Good. Lest the Lord builds a house. Lisa? Yes, we all sacrifice to be here. Good. Yes. I don't think church has to be a building. Correct. Correct. The church doesn't have to be a building. It's the body. And that's one of the things that, where do you go to church? Well, Faith Chapel on Sunday morning in a building. Well, at my church, we, and sometimes we, that, that so messes up. That's why I'm saying this has to be a revelation that rocks my thinking that church isn't here now. Okay, just a little more. Yeah. He does. But, you know, as believers, what is our commission? What are we Good. supposed to be doing? That door needs to be open for anyone. Good. Like the way they look, the way they dress, or how they talk. Good. God is already bringing those people when those doors are open. So sometimes we get so... Let me catch up with you for those that are listening. Um, this is... What's the first part again? Because I got lost. Um, Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together as the manner and custom, but even so much more as you see the day approaching. And the last two major studies are saw as looking at the day of the Lord approaching. So you've got to come to church and that door should be open for whoever brings it, not just nice looking people. And Right, it's not just about how you look. It's, it's having the heart to receive Good. whoever comes through those doors. Having the heart to receive whoever comes through the doors. And, and also be asking. And, and everyone. Yes, and then be asking people to come together. And that's Hebrews 10, uh, 10, 24. Spur each other on. Don't stop going to church as the manner of some are, but more, as you see, is coming. If, if you labor in vain, then whatever you did and whatever you built isn't worth anything. Good. If you labor in vain, what you're doing doesn't have any value. And I have been at this a long time, and I got to tell you, there's some stuff that I've done for years that have no value, okay? And so I've got to become better at doing why I do what I do, unless the Lord builds the house. Okay, let's keep going with the next scripture, Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 18. And this is kind of the heart of this morning's message And also I say to you that you, Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gate of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, I got to say this before I move on, and that is he wasn't talking about Peter. He was saying what Peter talked about. He says uh, um, earlier, uh, um, who, who, do you, who do men say I am? Verse 13, Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, upon that, you are the Christ, the Son, of, and upon that, I will build my church. That's the phrase I want you to get out of this. I will build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Now, there's so much background in this. I could preach the rest of the day just on the background of this, but we got to get going. And, and, and I want, again, Revelation to understand 
What's taking place this morning is not church. It's a Sunday morning gathering, but it's morphed into the definition when you say we have church today. Okay, uh, we've got to get beyond that because unless the Lord builds the house, we have a religious gathering. We have a club. We have like-minded people coming together. And as long as you agree with what I say, we can get along. If we disagree, we'll take our ball and go home because we're more interested in being right than having relationships. Now, that'll preach a number of ways. But the point I I really want to uh, uh, unpack is is God has to be the director of where we are going as a group of believers. He's got to be the center of what, why, and how we do church. And when Jesus said, I will be will build my church, he wasn't talking about a Sunday morning happening. I got to say that again. He wasn't just saying, let's make our Sunday morning gathering be exceptional so other people want to come. Now, there's some of that in there. Yes, God wants us to be excellent at what we do on a Sunday morning, but we need to understand when Jesus said, I will build my church, he wasn't talking about Sunday morning services. He was talking about the ecclesia. The, the Greek word there, and I have it in my notes, I broke it down so you could say it, ecclesia, it means the called ones. I will build my church. He's not talking about church services, not talking about buildings, not talking about denominations, but I am talking about people who come under my authority as a governing body, the called out ones. And so when we talk about the church in Seely Lake, the ecclesia of Seely Lake. It's more than Faith Chapel, more than the Catholic Church, more than Mission Bible Fellowship, more than Baptist Church, name one. It's more than that. It's the called out ones, the ones who worship God as the Lord of their life. And so when Jesus said, I will build my church, he's not talking about Faith Chapel. We're a part of a lot bigger picture, right? And one of the things down through the years I've really enjoyed is our pastors get together uh, and pray together on Thursday mornings as we recognize that we're called to a community to pastor, not a church to pastor. And I have loved the camaraderie that's built as we pray together over Sealy Lake. And what I love is when tears start to flow as we start, start talking about the lost and the broken and the hurting because sometimes what you need to make your prayers more more better is tears. You need to get your heart involved with God's heart because his heart breaks for people that are in bondage. Not about doctrine. Yes, get your doctrine as good as you can. But God's heart's moved more by your heart that takes his heart and sees something in need to the place you leave your comfort zone and get involved and get your hands messy but I'm retired. I don't have to do that anymore. You don't retire in heaven's kingdom work, okay? I think you become a different season in your life where you don't go to a place to to work for an occupation. Your retirement should now send you into full-time ministry more than any other time. That's retirement in heaven's kingdom. I got to get back to my notes. So this question is almost a trick question because it's not talking just about what happens to make our Sunday morning gatherings exceptional. It's more about how we do life. So if I wanted to make my church a better place to go, it does touch on what takes place here Sunday morning, but more than that, I am about my father's business, okay? Now let's turn to Galatians chapter 4. Kind of turn some corner. I'm still laying a foundation for the basis of the coming messages, how to make my church a better place to go. And let's look at the Father's heart concerning you. Not clergy, but you and me. And so in Galatians chapter 4, let's look at verse 4 through 7. Galatians 4, 4. 
Well, when the fullness of time had came, God sent forth Jesus, his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that might, we might receive the spirit of adoption. I'll talk about that in a moment. We might receive the adoption as sons. And because you were sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I could talk all day on this topic. And it's, it's something that the, I think, overall church has not understood. When God calls us his sons and daughters, he's not. And he says, you have been given the spirit of adoption. It's way different than what we have in our culture and our thinking of sons and daughters and adoption. Paul tapped into the Hebrew thinking and <coughs> Rome. Rome was obsessed with adoption. I don't have time to go there, but Rome was extremely obsessed with adoption. A father had the authority over the family, ultimate authority. If, his, if he didn't like his child, he could give his child away, he could sell his child, he could kill his child, he could do whatever he wanted to. Okay, But the purpose of the Hebrew thinking and this Roman adoption thinking was you want to raise your kids to take over the family business. And so at the, at the bar mitzvah time of a, a Hebrew child, he would be trained in the Torah, the Old Testament law of God, but the goal was to train him the foundations to take over the family business. And he would be trained to take over father's business. And at the right age, the, the son would start going to work with, with dad, with father, until he was able to he know the ropes. He knew why the father would do what he'd do. And then he would, the, the progression was natural. The son would take over and the father would fade into the background and the family business would continue. You've got to have that thinking when you talk about sons and daughters, that spirit of adoption. Back to the Roman law. In order their son to take over the family business, he would have to adopt his son before he could legally become heir to the father's business. Now, one of the things that messes this up in this culture, a huge factor is that the majority of people I know do not have dads that they can rapport with on a heart-to-heart -heart basis. And too many times, our dads were such horrific representations of God, we don't want anything to do with them. I don't want the family business. I don't want to do it dad's way because he was such an extreme, poor representative of God. But in the in the God vernacular, when God takes us on as sons and daughters, we don't have an angry God. We have a father that is deeply invested in who you are. Now, personally, I grew up with a dad that was extremely successful uh, um, at, at crossing this line. My dad was a man of God in the pulpit and at home. And, and I never went through the stage where my dad was stupid. And then when I got in about 25, he got over it. And, and man, I couldn't believe how smart he was. And I never went through that because my dad was so exceptional. And so one of the things that, that uh, not long ago when I talked about your wounded heart causes you not to look at Father God with benevolence or longing, and that's a problem. And so, God, I pray for the hearts of everybody in this room that you would heal what the enemy twisted to see our Father as someone to be afraid of. Instead, God, would you cause us to understand that we want Father to be radically effective in my life. So, this whole thinking, God appointed you to be adopted as sons. What does it say there? Verse 4, 
fullness time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the spirit of adoption. We might receive adoption. And because of that, he put his spirit within us so that we could operate the family business. Okay, let me keep going with the next scripture in line. John chapter 15, verse 15. Let's go to verse 14. I don't think it made it to these notes, but I I want verse 14. Jesus was talking. Now, man, there's so much I wish I could. I I gotta keep going though. When Jesus introduced the concept of Father God, I think all the Hebrew people go, can can we say that? He called God Father? Because they were so they wanted to respect God so much that the actual name of Elohim, Yahweh, God, was lost to the Hebrew people in a sense because they didn't say that name. You you wanted a, ultimate respect for it. And so that, that there was that distance. And even, even with the Hebrew people, they misunderstood God as Father. And so when Jesus started talking about my Father, I think the Hebrew people were just like, I, I don't know. Can we have that relationship? But we know today we can, right? And so when Jesus is introducing this concept, verse 14, it says, you are my friends if you do whatever I commanded you. No longer do I call you servants because a servant doesn't know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends for all the things that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. Verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you do in the Father, whatever you ask in the Father in my name, he will do it to you. And these things I command you, love one another. What I want you to get from here is when Jesus brings us into the relationship of sons and daughters, he is talking about a relationship that goes beyond servant-slave. Because a servant doesn't know what the heart of the father wants. But the son, born, raised, and trained into following the father's heart, when pressure happens or something happens, their knee-jerk reaction is, well, this is what Father would do. It's an obvious answer. Here's what Father would do. And so when you move into position as an adopted son, as you move into the position as a friend with God, you approach life differently. You grab that foundation. Now, this is really good stuff, and it deserves more airtime than just a few minutes on a Sunday morning. But this is a major foundation for the whole question. If I wanted church to be a better place to go, I would. Hmm. And the rest of our time talking about the difference between the heart of a servant and the heart of a son. Sonship is not a matter of gender. So ladies, I know we're talking male type thing, but it's more than that. It, it's, it's talking about sons and daughters. And, and just to know, men, you're going to get even with, because the rest of, of eternity, you're going to be the bride of Christ. So, you know, if you get hung up on that gender thing, you know, just get over it. So we're, it's not gender, it's not age, but it's an attitude of the heart towards the Father. And for reasons way beyond my understanding, God chose you and us, and he gave you an honored position as a son and a daughter to fulfill the Father's heart in life, to fulfill our part of taking over the Father's business. And what did the Father want? God, what's on your heart? When I pray, I loved what Andy said. She started out with her shopping list. God, I want you to do this and this and this. And the Holy Spirit said, no, I want you to stop. I want you to pray according to my heart. And so as a son and a daughter, uh, um, destined for adoption, moving into a position of taking over the family business, Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. 
And because you are now operating with the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit that's in the heart of adopted ones, you are pursuing the heart of the Father on how to live. And so I don't know why, but God chose to give us an inheritance as sons and daughters, not servants. And so in talking about making my church a better place to go, I want to look at some heart issues when it comes to the topic of church. Now, I should have you interceding and praying for me. Because down through the years, I have twisted this because of legalistic view of church attendance. I think I get it adjusted right, and then I start talking to Heather Ann. And she points out how grossly misrepresented that concept is to Gary. Because the high value I place on going to church. I'm just warning you. So pray that I get it right and that I'm not walking in legalism because whether side, whether, whether you're on one side of the fence or the other side of the fence, we step into legalism like that. Give me a list of do's and don'ts. But I am talking about a heart relationship with the Father that keeps church attendance in perfect position, okay? So please, season it with that reality, okay? And I, I, I resisted, because I didn't have enough time, talk to Heather Ann and help her um, change my wording so it was more palatable. But after I screw it up, go talk to her. She is exceptional at doing this, but I was born and raised in church. I was born and raised in legalism at church. Not because the church wanted it that way. The enemy twisted it and it touched my heart and sometimes I still have knee-jerk reaction to it. And so that, that's just a precursor. And so, okay. The highest quality of ministry flows from sonship. I've got to say that again. The highest quality of ministry comes, flows from sonship. Servants are motivated by what? Wages and what else? Huh? Duty. Servants, huh? Favor. Earning. Servants are motivated by fear, anxiousness. But a son is motivated by what? Love, a heart of love. And that's what 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about. Regardless of what kind of power ministry you have, whether you speak in tongues and prophesy and do all these healing, it's almost irrelevant if it doesn't come from love, a relationship with Father. And so when Jesus, he said, everything you've seen me do is a reflection of the Father's heart. I don't do anything of my own. And so the church has grossly misrepresented the father as the angry one. And if it wasn't for Jesus standing in the way and saying, no, Jesus, no, God, God, father, they're really good at heart. You have to, free. that's not true at all. God's not willing that any should perish. God's heart, I believe, cries at the lost, at the broken. That's why he was willing to send his son to bring us into a place of adoption so that we could go on with the family business. Father's heart fulfilled in Sealy Lake. Father's heart fulfilled in your home. Father's heart fulfilled in ministry, not preaching on Sunday morning. I've got to get back to my notes. Okay, so the highest quality of ministry flows from sonship. Servants are motivated by wages, but a son is motivated by relationship with the father. This is what would please the father. Most of the time, when I am laying out songs, what do I want to sing this morning? I go, oh, I like that song. I like that song. You know, you know what? That's irrelevant. Father, what do you want this morning? And then I stop and listen. Okay? So in the family business, this is how the father would do it. This is a huge statement, and I don't have time to go into it more than I already have, and that is we live in a consumer mentality society. We live in a society 
that surrounds a consumer mentality. What's in it for me? Where We go where we get the best service. If it doesn't meet my wins, I will take my business and go elsewhere. I didn't like how they treated me. I'm not going back to the one stop or, you know, just whatever. On a whim, we are not, you know, it used to be back in the, in the day, there was a sense of um, loyalty. When you started doing business at a family store or whatever, people would shop there. They wouldn't go to Walmart when Walmart come in. They stayed at a family business or whatever until they didn't or the family business went out of, and everybody went to Walmart. Anyway, but, but the point is that consumer mentality on a whim, I will take my business elsewhere. I want to ask, ask this question as a group, answer this question. This consumer mentality how does that affect choosing where I go to church? I'm going to ask it again. This whole consumer, I want the best service. I just, I got to have it this way. How does that consumer mentality affect choosing where to go to church on a Sunday morning? Talk to me. It's about me. Okay, it's probably not spirit-led. It can be, but probably not. Okay, that's my criteria. Is that God's? I'm not going to answer that. Legalism has been huge in the Baptist church, in the Pentecostal church, the Lutheran church. Yes, yes. When that becomes bigger than what God has. Yes, when my legalistic thinking. I think that's when you lose those that don't know Jesus. Yes. Because they can't, get, they can't get through all that. Those that want to come to Jesus can't get my legalistic, this is how you got to do church. Someone else I heard talking? Okay, how does consumer mentality factor into the majority of why people choose a church? If I don't agree with you, I'm going someplace else. If I don't like the music, if pastor preaches past noon, I've got you guys trained though. Linda? Linda? Okay, a scripture about pleasing our itching ears. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. It can be. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. And so let me, obvious answer, given the whole attitude I just presented, how should my church attendance, no, a church choice of where to go to church, um, what's the obvious answer in what I just said about sons and daughters adopted and all, what should be my criteria for going to a church? If he preaches out of the Bible, God's word, Father, where do you want me to go? Because I truly believe God has implemented certain people into churches where the pastor doesn't preach the word right or whatever, the music isn't the way. But God's saying, I am sending you into a place where you won't be comfortable, but because you're after the Father's heart, how you choose a church is that's the bottom line. Why do I go to church? Because I feel, first and foremost, Gary's right. How screwed up is that? No. My foundation of why I choose a church is because I've been in God's presence, and I feel like we should go here because Father wants me to. I'm listening to God. Next question, consumer mentality. How does that affect my church attendance? I'm going, to get, I'm going to get messy here in just a little bit, so just warning you. How does consumer mentality affect my church attendance? 
I don't feel like it, so I'm not going to go. What am I getting out of it? You know, one of the things that I sticks in my craw is when our people say, you know, I used to go to church there, but they, the pastor just wasn't feeding me. I'm going. Huh? No one said hi to me. No one paid attention to me. Yeah? Because it's all about. Yeah? A person I don't like goes to church there. And, and, and as Barb just talked about, the church should be a hospital. You, you know, so many messed up people at my church. Well, praise God. That's why we do what we do. D? Yes. The hypocrites go to church. And the answer is, they're closer to God than you are then. Yeah. So commercialism, consumer mentality, affects my church attendance because it's based on my feelings, my whims. Okay? It's not based on what Father's heart is. Can you get legalistic with this? Oh, totally. Totally. I'm, I'm telling you. The enemy twists this all the time. So you've got to weigh this according to Father's heart, not Gary's. Please, take this to God and say, give me your heart on this. Next question, how does this attitude affect my thinking towards ministry? Let me give you foundation. Everyone in this room, by Father, has called you ask you to be a full-time minister. You're not the pastor of the church. Heather Ann and I have been put in that position. But you are as called to be a minister where he's called you as much as Billy Graham was. Name your most spiritual leader. Their calling is the same as yours. We have been called by God to minister. But a consumer mentality does what to that call? Talk to me. A consumer mentality, what does it do to your involvement in ministry? Okay. Okay. It, it turns you into a cherry picker, doing this because I'm comfortable, or I am good at this. And one of the things, I listen to Bill Johnson quite a bit. One of the things that, that he gets on, I think he's right on, is there are so many people that were only minister in areas that they're good at. Because that, they're not being spirit-led, they're, they're led by their talents. I need to be spirit-led. One of the things else Bill Johnson says, do you know what? Bill Johnson has never been called by God to be a pastor. He says, I've never, I've never been called by God to this. He grew up and raised in a pastor's home. And at some point, the, his dad said, we really need someone for the junior boys. Bill's heart towards the father said, I'll do that. Not because he's good at it. He found out that the church needed a, a, a bookstore type thing. He's had no business experience. He said, I'll do that. Not because, because he had the father's heart. The father's heart affects your response to the father call of ministry. What does a servant's heart do to that call? Ooh. Wages, obligation, fear, and so ministry that flows from a son's heart is high quality versus someone that's doing it out of obligation or because I have to. The servant only serves because they have to. So, what heart attitude do I have concerning making my church a better place to go? Servant or son? We're going to close with this question in just a moment, but let me ask it again. What heart do you have towards making your church a better place to go? Servant or son? Let's say that Pastor Gary woke up one Sunday morning, decided to stay home because I felt like it. Didn't, didn't let anybody know. Diggins didn't know music. I just like, you know what? I don't want to go to church today. I decided to stay home. Why would that be wrong? Talk to me. 
I'm not doing God's will. Why is it wrong for Pastor Gary, just because I feel like it, to stay home? There's, there's some major reasons. Obligation. I am obligated to be here. You guys pay my wages. I, I, okay, I'm an example. Okay? Huh? A commitment. I've committed. You guys expect me. I, I have dedicated myself. I hope you guys can rely on the fact that not based on a whim or my feelings for the Sunday, I do church or I don't do church. Again, why is it wrong if I just say, I think I'll stay home. Okay? My teaching? Okay? People are relying on me to give. It is my job. Okay? I'm satisfying myself, not the Father. I'm the head. You can't have a following if someone's not leading. Linda? It shows a heart condition. It shows whether I'm a son or a servant. Now, I, I, I don't mean to twist this. Whose choice is it for you to attend Faith Chapel? Your whim or the Father's? Is it any different on a Sunday morning if I wake up and I go, you know what? I think I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather be outside right now. I would rather do this or this, you know, something come up and, you know, I know I'm dedicated to coming to church and all and, and, and I, you know, you're planning on me being there. I know I'm not paid to be a part, but I'm not doing it for the body. Can you see how it's not one standard for the pastor minister? It's the standard for the body to flow from the Father's heart. I am not taking church attendance, and God, please help us not to receive guilt motivation. Because if you motivate, if Pastor Gary motivates you on guilt because of this issue, it'll only last so long. Or you'll go to another church. <laughs> Take my, you know, you can't talk to me that way. But what I want to get in this... <sighs> This is where the rubber kind of meets the road. On church attendance, who are you trying to please? Father. It comes down. He doesn't call me servants. Gary, you weren't in church today. I pay your wages. And out of obligation, you need to be there. Because if I minister out of obligation, if I minister from Father's heart, radically different, right? Right? Being spirit-led versus being got to go to church. Otherwise, Pastor Gary will know I wasn't there and he just preached on that. You know, it's like, okay, so why do we plug into church based on our feelings? I'm not going to spend much time on this. I just, let's say that you applied the work ethic to your job that you use to attend church. I just keep moving. I believe partly this whole issue has to do with the son versus servant mentality. Sons help the father build the house where servants only serve in the house. Sons see a bigger picture where servants only do what they have to. And when church attendance comes into play, it has nothing to do with Pastor Gary's opinion. It has to do with father's opinion. Okay? You take that home with you and get before God and you walk out what you feel he is speaking to your heart because Pastor Gary's opinion is almost irrelevant, right? And so what we need is Father... Let me use one more illustration to try and get quick and get, get this plane landed. Let's say we arrive here on a Sunday morning and um, uh, in the night, a bear dragged the neighbor's garbage over here and spread it around out, uh, out on the front lawn. And you got here type thing, and you saw the, the mess there. How does a servant respond? They basically look and says, man, someone should clean this mess up. I wonder who should be. Pastor Gary should be. How, you know, he probably doesn't know. He should be out here with a garbage you know, type thing. A servant looks at it that way um, because it's a hard issue. How will his son respond if it's his church? He starts cleaning it up. Okay? And so a, a son looks at it and they clean it. Why? Because the father would. 
The Father's heart is towards that. And so instead of saying, wow, this, I can't believe this church doesn't have a better children's ministry. Instead of that, a heart of a son says, Father, how should I be involved in what makes this church a better place to attend? Make sense? And so I want to simply close with these few personal questions. And again, I just pray Holy Spirit would wash all the, the, the um, Klingons that comes from Pastor Gary's religious attitude towards it. God give us a heart towards serving you as a son and daughter of a most high God. Let's ask these questions kind of in a prayer time. Whose kingdom am I building? Mine or Father's? If being fully aware that God has called me personally to full-time ministry, how does that affect my view of church? Do I realize I need to be full of the Holy Spirit in order, out, in order to walk out ministry? When it comes to making my church a better place to go, do I approach this question as a consumer or a son? And if I wanted to make my, better, my church a better place to go, here's what I'd do. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take us beyond legalism, take us beyond denomination, church attendance, beyond all the things that we can get lost in. I pray, Father, we would start to approach life more than we ever have before because making my home a better place to do has to do with you being at the center of my life as a son and daughter. It radically affects my whole view of making church a better place to go because everything I do flows out this is what the Father would like for me. I pray your blessing upon this, your people. God, break us out of legalism. Break us out of our old traditions. Why we do what we do. Let it flow from the heart of a Father. I pray more than any other time in our life that we would have an intimate relationship with the Father because intimacy is what gives birth. Birth brings life and we need life in Lake. We need life in our home. And so God, I pray a relationship with Father would flow way more than a servant, but that of a son and daughter of the Most High God. I just want to speak over you a blessing from Father's heart. God, today, you bless every person here you bless everything they touch. You bless everything that they invest in themselves. And I'm asking God this week, as they have special personal time with you, a special date with the one that they love, that there would be an intimacy that would be breathed in them that they've never had before. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen.